welcome to Dogs with Torches. In this episode, we are joined with Dr. Thomas Ward to discuss the philosophy of the great 14th century Franciscan theologian, John Duns Scotus. Dr. Ward received his master's in philosophy from Oxford University and received his PhD from UCLA Berkeley. His research interests focus on medieval philosophy, specifically that of Duns Scotus, and his publications include Scotism about possible natures in the Philosophical Quarterly and A Most Mitigated Friar, Scotus on Natural Law and Divine Freedom in the American Catholic Philosophical Quarterly. Dr. Ward has most recently written a short introduction to Duns Scotus's thought titled Order by Love, an Introduction to John Duns Scotus. Dr. Ward, thank you so much for joining with us today. It's good to be here with you, Hunter. So I figured we could just dive right into uh, the subject matter. What can you tell us about Duns Scotus? You know, where was he born? Where was he educated? Did uh, did he teach at any of the universities in, uh, in medieval Europe? Yeah, I wish we knew more. But one um, one problem that all of us Scotus scholars have is that we just know pitifully little. Um, what we more or less take ourselves to know is that he was uh, born in a, a village called Duns in in Scotland, and <clears throat> at some point uh, traveled to Oxford uh, with the Franciscans and uh, was educated there. Uh, uh, began to teach at Oxford, possibly at Cambridge. Uh, Stephen Dumont has recently revived the argument that that he did have a Cambridge period. Um, uh, went to Paris and spent, you know, the, what we would think of as the height of his career at the University of Paris. Um, <clears throat> then was uh, for reasons we don't really know about, uh, sent to Cologne in Germany, uh, where he was probably the, um, the teacher at the Franciscan house of, uh, uh, studies in Cologne. And, and he died, he was only there for about a year, maybe a little longer before he died, uh, in 1308. So, um, you know, just a little over 40, 42, 43 years old, probably when he died, uh, prolific, but not particularly organized. <laughs> and so uh, not only do we know very little about his life, but even his uh, literary remains were in, um, were and in some sense st still are in a sorry state of organization, which has made it difficult for scholars to know exactly what he thought about everything he wrote about, um, w whether or to what extent he changed his mind about various topics. And so Scholars who work on more of the textual side of, of SCOTUS um, really have their work cut out for them trying to figure out just uh, just w w what he actually said. And then for philosophers and theologians like me who who aren't really in the texts but just want to understand SCOTUS's thought, you know, we're we're reliant on them for uh, th those other scholars, the text the text people for delivering to us what what we hope is Scotus's thought, but there's a lot of uncertainty there. Right, right. Yeah, one of the difficulties is that uh, just the, the the when exactly, if I if I can ask, did I uh, the historical critical editions of the Ordinatio and, and Scotus's works? When did that take off? Like, like, has it been completed? Is it still an ongoing process or? But the Scotistic Commission at the Vatican got going in the I think the 30s. Um, the first volume of of the Ordinatio, the, the prologue, came out in 1950. Uh, I think now both the Ordinatio, which is the uh, the ordered or or um, carefully edited version of his sentences commentary, along with the Lectura, which is a, an early effort of of commenting on the sentences. The Scotistic Commission now has published both of those. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure both are complete. Um, and and the last volume of the lecture, I think, came out in 2019 or 20. So, I mean, this is 70 years, uh, not for all of Scotus's works, but only for those two sentences commentaries. And, and meanwhile, as, as, as you know, the uh, St. Bonaventure University people have been um, or did do what they came what they called the um the opera philosophica his uh, commentaries on aristotle sentences 
Aristotle, his commentaries on Aristotle, uh, and uh, and then a couple other minor works. But but the big one that still is um, in process, and I don't have the inside scoop on exactly where things stand, is the Reportatio, the latest um, sentences commentary, which is just a mess. I won't even try to summarize just how messy that all is, um, because I'd, I'd probably get details wrong. Yeah. Right, right. And then you wonder, I, you wonder why SCOTUS is understudied and underappreciated, you know, when you have all of this, this chaos surrounding his works. <laughs> right, I was gonna, I was gonna ask, I mean, it, it, one of the difficulties is that people are, are sort of asking the question, you know, why haven't I heard of this guy? And this is one of the reasons is that so much of his, his works are uh, textually contentious, and it's it's not altogether clear what's Scotist and what might be later additions by uh, by other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, famously, um, uh, Heidegger. You know, everyone says, "Oh, Heidegger wrote a dissertation on Scotus," and then people who don't know very much about this try to make some sort of connection between. Heidegger's worries about onto theology and go to theory of university or something like that. It turns out the uh, uh, what Heidegger was thinking was Scotus's uh, was actually actually belonged to Thomas of Erfurt and has little to do with Scotus's thought. So um, yeah, and, and unfortunately, history is uh, littered with mistakes like that. Uh, works attributed to scotus that didn't belong to him uh, birthplaces attributed to scotus which were not his uh, there's a long tradition of of the irish in fact thinking that scotus was one of their own um and still to this day there there are some people who defend the the irish um nationality of of dun scotus but as far as i know uh the the most serious historians are are on the side of his uh northern provenance <clears throat> right and then if I can uh, maybe follow up on what you said about Heidegger, because of the uh, the contentious nature of what's actually Scotus and what are, are spurious documents, uh, has has scholarship ever lent uh, anachronistic readings of, of Scotus or, or readings of Scotus that might not actually be faithful to the works themselves and might, might, might be uh, uh, sort of artificially contrived, you might say? Uh, po po possibly. I mean, I, I've sometimes wondered if the um, all the the to do made of Scotus's theory of the university of the concept of being comes from this uh, era of misunderstanding, you know, and and just bizarro theories of university um, offered by Deleuze and claiming some sort of Scotistic background uh they just sort of get caught up into the lore of a certain strand of of contemporary philosophy what you know what we call continental philosophy mm. and then it's it's just it becomes very difficult to separate um the scotus of the lore from the scotus that we know through the texts and and i i think that probably the um the, the very critical takes on scotus that we got in the late late 20th century it, uh, among theologians associated with the radical orthodoxy movement probably uh were were drawing on this early 20th century um misattribution well if if i can maybe switch uh topics a little bit and maybe discussing more of uh scotus's broader philosophical commitments i figured maybe we could first discuss scotus's very interesting proof for the existence of god uh how does Scotus and his works argue for the existence of, of 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 God? As I understand it, his most famous argument is sort of a, a, a it's a threefold via, you might say, where it's it's based on uh, perfection, on finality, and you might say efficient causality with respect to to necess necess necessity and possibility. And what what can you say to that? Yeah, good. That, yeah, that's that's well said. He he calls these um, three primacies. And, uh, and and argues first that there is a nature that has <clears throat> uh, a, a nature that has one primacy and nature has the other and the third and then argues that uh, one and the same nature has all three primacies uh, argues that only one such nature can have all three such primacies um, and that no nature can have one of the primacies without having the other two 
So from from all of that, we get uh, a, a nature such that if it exists, is is of the right sort of nature to be God, uh, because it's not just a an impersonal first cause. It acts for the sake of ends, and so is personal, and it's uh, a most eminent or perfect nature, and so is you know has that unsurpassably great aspect that we associate with the sort of worship that we um that we offer to god so that's uh th that's the sort of layout so then the so then the strategy you might think of it as um you know c combining a sort of anselmian modal argument with uh, an aristotelian or thomistic cosmological argument and um and it's the result is something quite nice i mean i i think it's a, a pretty original argument um doesn't come out of the blue again has these anselmian and aristotelian sources i think avicenna is an important um influence on scotus but scotus isn't simply repeating avicenna um the basic idea for scotus is that rather than starting as aquinas does in the first and second ways with contingent facts about uh, actually existing things. Scotus begins with what he takes to be necessary uh, propositions uh, about possible things. So if Aquinas, say, begins the second way with something has come into existence, Scotus begins his uh, 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 argument for a first inefficiency by uh, claiming that something can come into existence, so it's a claim, it's a poss it's a it's a possibility claim, and then derives the um, the actual existence of something that is able to bring about something else, but itself is not able to be brought about by anything else, um, and such a such a nature for Scotus does not remain. Uh, a mere possible, because if if it were merely possible, uh, then nothing in fact could come into existence. You need something actual, which has the the power, the capacity to bring about other things, uh, uh, to actualize possible natures. And so we we get to a, a first, uh, not quite a first cause, right? Because what Scotus is uh, really concerned about, and this. This is a subtle point, but, you know, subtle doctor and all that. Uh, Scotus, at the end of the each of these three ways, um, he wants the, the nature that is first in each of these ways to, um, uh, to have that feature of, to have that primacy, whether or not it in fact... Um, uh, brings anything about. So rather than uh, concluding to a first efficient cause, the way that uh, Aquinas's argument does, he concludes to something that is first in the order of efficiency. And so whether or not uh, that nature in fact efficiently causes anything, it still is the first in efficiency because it is the first thing able to produce an effect. Again, whether or not it in fact does. And so, so it is a subtle point, but it 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 resonates with a broader commitment of Scotus, a theological commitment commitment of Scotus, which is that um, uh, G God is completely independent of the created order. And of course, any Orthodox uh, Christian theologian is going to affirm this, but it's it's a, it's a particular emphasis of Scotus's. And so, by having even his natural theology conclude to uh, something that is um, the first thing able to cause an effect rather than the first thing causing an effect, uh, he, he you know, elevates that independence of God. And it also... It, oh, no, sorry, go ahead. No, that, that, was, uh, that was a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I probably no. should have paused here. There. <laughs> no, this is great. And as I understand it, it also has to do with... the uh, Scotus's concern has to do with the demands of demonstration that it has to start from necessary propositions and those propositions lead to a conclusion and whether or not you know things are coming and going out of existence or whether or not things are efficiently caused that's not a necessary proposition so 
it, it arguably could be the case that's another worry that Scotus has is he wants to satisfy the demands of an Aristotelian syllogism. You're, you're exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And he, he says as much as, as one of the reasons why he uh, pursues the route that he does. So that's just one aspect of uh, the, the the threefold primacy that, that Scotus offers is is uh, with respect to, um, uh, you might say, the, the, the necessary... Um, who's able to, 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 to bring about things in, in existence is, 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 is this first, uh, but there's also, uh, as, as, as we alluded to finality and, uh, per- perfection. So wh- where do those aspects come into Scotus's argument? Yeah. Um, so the, the finality argument is, is structurally similar to the efficiency argument. So, so the claim there is, um, something is, um uh able to be ordered to an end right the, so not uh something in fact is brought about for the sake of an end but something is able to be ordered to an end uh and then uh, uh the, the and then the argument runs exactly as the argument for the first in the order of efficiency that in order for something to be able to be brought about for the sake of the of an end <clears throat> There must be something that is uh, uh, able to be an end, um, and not just an end that is both uh, a, a, an end of something else and also itself able to be ordered to an end, but just an end, the, uh, able to be a final end. Um, and that, for Scotus, so, something's a nature's being able to be the final end is for Scotus a a, a condition on anything's being ordered to an end because he thinks that uh final causal relations are transitive just as efficient causal relations are so if you um if you have a nature that is um, able to bring about an effect but itself is also able to be an effect of something else that for scotus is 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 sufficient to show that it it is not of the right sort of nature to be first in the order of efficiency um and it's, it cries out for an explanation, right? Well, what about you know the thing that is able to bring it about, and so on and so forth. Same thing for ends. Uh, something that by nature is able to be ordered to an end, but is also able to be the end of something else, uh, is it does not have the right sort of nature to be the first in the order of finality. It it too cries out for an explanation. You know the the thing to which it is ordered uh, or it. To, the thing to which it is able to be ordered as an end is that thing is that nature uh also able itself to be further ordered to an end and so on and so forth so we get um you know in both the uh, way of efficiency and in the way of finality we get arguments um against the possibility of an infinite regress of uh of efficient causal relations and uh final causal relations and they, the two arguments work pretty much exactly the same way. What's nice about this is that the, in a way, like the, if you're, suppose you're a skeptic about teleology um, and you think that in fact, uh, uh, lots of things in the actual world uh, don't act for the sake of ends. Scotus might be, Scotus would disagree with that. He thinks that everything in the world is in fact uh, teleologically ordered, but he could say something like this well f- f- to get you could be sympathetic with the argument even if for now you deny that some things are in fact uh ordered to an end would you just grant that something can be ordered to an end and from that very weak premise uh i'll show you that there is in fact something that is the final end of everything else um now i actually i i, I, sh- I should qualify real quick he, he doesn't con- automatically conclude to uh that if there is a nature that is first in the order of finality then any anything whatsoever is is in fact ordered to that end uh it's he he does argue that but he doesn't he he thinks that that needs to be argued uh uh as as a further conclusion yeah Look, and that makes sense. It, it, it as from what I've read of of not just Scotus but also uh, Aquinas on finality, it's almost like finality and efficient ca- causality are two sides of the same 
coin that if, if you have efficient causality it entails it's going to become something and therefore is is a final cause and if you have final causality that entails that there's an agent bringing about that that, that finality yeah you're, you're exactly right about that and it's one thing that um that gets o- overlooked um as, as, especially when we when we try to do natural theology, not just as like interpreting older older thinkers, but as as proposing uh, older arguments as um, you know p- potentially persuasive to modern people, it, it's hard to get really in the weeds um, in all of the Aristotelian background that's at play in Aquinas's uh, arguments and Scotus's arguments. But but yeah, at the end of the day, there. there like a, a modern person might might well think well yeah it's one thing to argue that there's uh, a first efficient cause and then that has very little to do with whether or not there's a first final cause or an ultimate end and so maybe we could have one argument without the other or accept one argument without without the other but it's um it's pretty much unthinkable um that you would have an aristotelian notion of efficient causation um and yet deny that agents act for the sake of ends. Now, and this um, Scotus appeals primarily to physics book two uh, for this point, this this uh, connection between efficient and final causation, but it's, it's all over the place in Aristotle. So yeah, that, that's a nice point. It's a nice point. And then with respect to the, the, the third uh, way, the way of, we, of preeminence, is this also a, a modal argument that 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 scotus is making that that like the the possibility of perfection entails uh a first in 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 the chain you might say or is is he thinking of something different yeah something is able to be uh greater than another thing so because what's um uh so scotus is thinking here of uh, um you know a kind of realm of natures that we can um, that we can think about independent of uh, knowing whether or not any of them exist. And, and it's it, so where we talk about, um, you know, something possibly being greater than another thing in Scotus's um, way of expressing himself, it would be something like uh, uh, that there is a nature such that it is um that it surpasses another nature in excellence or something like that and and then uh uh yeah so so that's that that's that i mean the 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 intuitive way of getting at the third way the way of eminence is that uh that if you if you're willing to grant say that a uh a human being is better than a charcoal briquette. Uh, that's that's the example I use in the book. Um, y- you know, in virtue of what <laughs> is is the one better than the other? Because we can't do you know a broadly Aristotelian um, intra species uh, comparison. You know, the one is a better human than the other. No, I mean these are two very different kinds of things, and yet there's a sense that. A human being is is a greater, not a greater this or that, but just a greater being. And then, um, and from from that fact alone, Scotus thinks that we uh, we must have something like uh, the the nature that is the unsurpassably great nature, and uh, its actual existence is required for the uh, actual surpassing of one thing over another thing and and so yeah we get a it's it's there's a modal component to that too but it relies on this um judgment that uh we can only that well one that we really can compare in greatness uh things of different kinds and two, that the ability to do such a comparison requires a top of the line nature and if I may ask, then, with respect to this threefold proof, d- does Scotus offer arguments for the, tr- the traditional divine attributes that w- that are commonly associated with God, like God's 
unicity or e- eternity? D- d- does he think that the attributes are implicit in his arguments for for God at all? Yeah, um, in the he offered these arguments in several places, including the sentences commentaries. But the one that I know best is a short book that he wrote called the Tractatus de Primo Principio. And and in that book, he offers the the three primacy arguments in one chapter, chapter three of that book. And then the fourth and by far the longest chapter of De Primo is uh, uh, proving various attributes. Um, Almost all the proofs rely on uh, theorems that were proved in chapter three. So he, so all of this is implicit. All of these traditional divine attributes are implicit in the nature that is uh, first in in all three of these ways. But yeah, uh, divine simplicity, infinity, unicity, uh, p- person. What I call personhood, uh, having an intellect and a will. Um, I mean, all these are all teased out in the fourth chapter of De Primo. Interesting. Okay. Uh, has there be, has there been a translation of the De Primo uh, in recent years? As I actually, if I remember correctly, you're 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 currently working on a translation of the De Primo. Yeah. Um. It, it was it was translated by Alan Walter, um, and uh, a guy named something Roche, um, in the 20th century. Both of those are out of print, um, and they're they're good, but. Uh, could be improved. And so I tried to improve them. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I have a translation and commentary on the De Primo Principio coming out uh, later this year, probably toward the end of 23 uh, with Hackett and try to make it um, easily accessible to an, a new generation of readers of SCOTUS. Um, and the translate and the, and the commentary anyway is is just, you know, meant to be very philosophically focused to help readers through SCOTUS's sometimes extremely difficult arguments. So hopefully, uh, uh, I, I really do think that SCOTUS's argument deserves a kind of place in the, the pantheon of um, natural theological efforts of the Middle Ages. And so when we, you know, we all look to whether or not you think the arguments are any good or not, you look to Anselm and Aquinas as, as having offered very important um arguments for god that that any person interested in um natural theology again for or against has to grapple with in a serious way and i'd really love for scotus's argument to take that place and and hopefully uh a, a readable philosophically accurate translation and commentary will help make that happen so i figured maybe we could switch tactics again and discuss some of Scotus's broader, uh, you might say, ontological commitments with respect to the nature of uh, of universals. Um, th- this was a very hotly contested issue in the Middle Ages of, you know, what are universals? What do they exist? What if they do exist? What do universals signify? You know, those sorts of questions. And Scotus himself is a realist with respect to the question of universals, but he has a very, you might say, uh, at least as I read them, of a very unique perspective on, on on the debate. So, if I can ask, how does how does Duns Scotus understand the notion of common nature? Are, are common natures things that subsist in the world for Scotus? Are are they you know Platonic universals? Do, do, do they exist in a universal way? What, what can you say to that? Yeah, I think Scotus himself thought that he was. Um... An Aristotelian about about these natures, and you know maybe that is not fully determinant enough uh, uh, to to pin down any particular Aristotelian. Um, you know, Porphyry, after all, reading the categories raised the issue about what sort of extramental status, if any, um, natures have, and that you know, as you know, uh, propelled lots of speculation in late antiquity into the Middle Ages. So in, in that broad sense, you know, we could say that both Aquinas and Scotus are Aristotelians. Um, Scotus thought, however, that the common nature, say humanity, uh, does not exist either as a mere concept or as a Platonic entity, but uh, as some uh, 
real unity that is somehow a less than numerical unity across all of its instances. So two human beings here, we share humanity. So there's there's your humanity and there's my humanity. And in some sense, they are the same, the same humanity. Now, that sounds perhaps weird looked at one way. If you try to get too metaphysical with that, it's like, well, in what sense then are there two human beings if our humanity is the same humanity? So Scotus says that, well, it's um, uh, specifically the same, same in kind or nature, but not numerically the same. Uh, it's somehow th that very nature is um, uh, fully present in you and fully present in me, but it is individuated in you um, and individuated in me and individuated by some intelligible feature that is extrinsic to human nature itself, you know, because uh, it's, it, it is that feature in virtue of which we are two humans instead of one human. And so it has to be something extrinsic to humanity itself that, um, that individuates each of us. So his theory of the common nature is uh, inexplicably linked up with his famous theory of individuation by hexiety, thisness. So there is the, uh, the human nature that we share, and then each of us has our own thisness, our own unique, unrepeatable, individuating entity that makes each of us the uh, individuals we are. So if I can maybe then follow up w w w with that uh, theme of uh... Hectate, I've never been able to pronounce it correctly. It's, it's... I, I think a few are probably okay. I say I usually say hexiety. Hexiety, okay. Uh, what what can you say to this? It, it's a very interesting uh, idea of of uh, that Scotus has of uh, the the what you might say the principle of individuation in the or, uh, the the principle that makes a concrete thing an individual thing rather than another individual thing. You mean what? What more can we say? <laughs> well, I mean th 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 that's one of the difficulties, as I understand it, is is that like Scotus kind of thinks that we don't really know, at least this side of the grave, what that principle is. We just know that it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's a, a theoretical, you know, post postulate. We we know it only indirectly, um, as a way of uh, making sense out of the phenomenon of of individuation when um uh for for scotus um and i think for aquinas uh unlike nominalists like occam the fact of um commonality is um you know explanatorily prior to the the fact of individuality and for someone like Occam would say there is no problem of individuation because there are only individuals. Um, and then he has quite a task on his hands to show, well, in what sense are things the same then, <laughs> like all the humans? Whereas um, uh, people like Scotus and, and Aquinas, I think, are more much more um, impressed by the fact of, of similarity or sameness of kind. And then... Um, and then try to explain individuality given that commitment to sameness. So, so yeah, uh, Scotus arrives at Hexiety as a this theoretical entity. We don't have direct access to it. So, you know, this raises several several kinds of problems. I mean, you might, I mean, you might have a, a worry like uh, if if all we know about a Hexiety is that it's the individuating thing then it looks like all the hexiades are the same. <laughs> right. <laughs> For all we know, they all have this nature. They individuate. <laughs> right, right, right. And so then they, they we have a, we have another one over many problem. You know, so what is it that makes one hexiade different from another hexiade? Mm. And, um, you know, SCOTUS, I, I mean, I, it, it's a clever rebuttal uh I, I think scotus would be unmoved by it because it a hexiety is by nature 
the sort of entity that is uh, that that f- fully terminates a species into individuals. It's just what its theoretical role is. It, it would be like saying, it would be like offering a Bradley style um, a refutation of real relations on the grounds that a real re- a real relation, if there were such a thing, would would have to have a real relation to the things that it relates. Mm. So then we get relations, relations, relations all the way down, and that's absurd or not. Uh, but you know, it just makes for a radical uh, either rejection of real relations or an acceptance of them, like all the way, just all the way down. And I I've never been moved by that Bradley and regress argument because I thought, well, it it just it misunderstands what the the theoretical role of a relation is. It's just mm. that it's that theoretical entity which relates things. That's its job. It doesn't it doesn't need further explanation. Now that might not be adequate. I mean, you might reject relations on on other grounds, but I've never been moved by uh, like the the gotcha sort of relations need to be related. And so similarly, I think. Um, Hexaeides don't need to be individuated. Uh, right. to, to offer that as an objection is to misunderstand the role that they're playing in Scotus's ontology. The other, the other sort of issue is um, what could, in principle, be known about them. And this, this is quite mysterious. Uh, God, according to Scotus, knows Hexaeides not just in their individuating role, but like something like the the peculiar content of the hexaity, but our only, the only hold that we have on, on, on content or character is something that is shareable. So the sort of access that God has to the hexaity in its own right is something that we can't fathom. And yet Scotus speculates that perhaps God offers to the blessed in heaven this this immediate awareness of the the whatness, so to speak, of of a hexiety, okay. <laughs> what, the whatness of the thisness, um, and that's you know that's that's a very exhilarating sort of thought. Um, but he denied that we could ever have access to that uh, uh, content without some sort of special cognitive boost from God. And then another interesting feature of Scotus's philosophy is, you might say, the emphasis he puts on the will and sort of the psychology of the will's inclinations, you might say. And, and, and you talk about in your book about how Scotus ha- thinks that that a human naturally has two inclinations, an affection for the common good and or, or, or you might say the, the affection for, for, for justice and the, the affection for um you know, a, a, a perfection of, of of your own self, if if that makes sense. Yeah, this is um, as as you know, this is a distinction that he borrows from Anselm, who developed it to try to explain primal angelic sin, and um, and Scotus uh, accepts it on on the same grounds, but but like Anselm, thinks that this t- these two affections of the will are um are generalizable across all he all he all creaturely wills um so that by by nature you know irrespective of whether we um whether our nature is tainted by original sin or or not uh just by nature um human willing has these two fundamental non-deterministic inclinations so uh, as you put it to one's own advantage or to the just and they're non-deterministic because uh Im- importantly the will is free and so there is nothing on scotus's view either that is um uh perceived as advantageous to oneself or that is perceived as uh good in itself or just that determines the will to will any particular um act um now that's you know that's quite a different view of the will from from aquinas uh, as as you know so um, what what do you think about uh, i mean there's a lot we could say but uh 
uh, what would be a good, a helpful place to turn to about this? Well, I mean, I, I know that this is something of a, of a, a contentious subject in, in Thomistic studies, because I've spoken with Dr. Minard about this question of uh, Aquinas' understanding of the will, and he thinks that both Aquinas and, and the later commentatorial tradition, they there are certain passages of, of Aquinas where it, it sounds very like he's giving uh, an account of the will that Scotus does that, that it has the ability to to act or not to act to to, to restrain oneself. But I haven't I, I haven't do, engaged in the scholarship well enough on that. That might make for a good episode in in the future, maybe. That, yeah, that would be. I'd, I I'd love to hear more about that. It's not something that I am, am qualified to 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 comment on for, in Aquinas. Um, well, yeah, but uh, yeah. Well, as, as I understand it, I mean, one of the interesting things, uh, or as I understand it, one of the interesting things that that medieval scholastic philosophers grappled with what was maybe the relationship between the intellect and the will, whether one faculty has like primacy or, or, or something. How exactly does Scotus see the relationship between the intellect, what it does, and the will and what it does? Yeah. Yeah, this was this was quite a hot debate. Uh, and, and it can seem really strange to contemporary people. But um, Scotus was on uh, roughly the the Franciscan side, so to speak, of this question, um, the <clears throat> primacy of the intellect of the of the will over the intellect, or the act of loving over the act of understanding. And the context in which this debate occurred was theorizing about the nature of the the beatific vision. You know, being perfectly bl blessed in heaven, what would be um, what sort of activity constitutes human perfection you know so if, if we imagine ourselves in heaven as um uh being human at the highest level what is that like and so scotus and other franciscans speculated that it was um primarily an act of loving the highest thing god himself now one condition for loving something, at least loving something as well as we can love it, is knowing a lot about it. <laughs> so then uh, the act of the intellect, um, beholding God, uh, understanding as much of God's essence as God allows us to understand in that perfecting state, that's all like going on, but it's going on as a condition for this act of love. Whereas um, Aquinas held basically the opposite, that the that the supreme primary activity is is that very act of understanding. And and um a, a love of God is consequent on that act of understanding, but it's it's intellect supreme for Aquinas, um, will supreme for Scotus. Now, from that basic context of of what's going on in the beatific vision, we get ramifications into aspects of, of ethics and action theory um, that are meant to be general. So then we what we see in SCOTUS is a kind of playing out of this um, emphasis on the primacy of love in the beatific vision across his philosophy, um, including, I think, the, 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 uh, the will's freedom and the way in which on SCOTUS's view, there is no... Um, there is no act of understanding uh, su such that its object uh, compels the will to will it. Um, so we, the will, in the sense, can always refrain from um, from choosing what what the intellect judges to be the good thing to do here and now, or even the best thing to do here and now. The will has this radical freedom on Scotus's view. Um, and so in that sense can, in, in its um, refraining, it can, in a sense, uh, uh, d direct the intellect to look elsewhere. And so we get this kind of a attention directing um, capacity of the will on, on Scotus's view, which is quite interesting that, you know, of course, in this faculty psychology, the will can't understand anything. So it's not like it can say, you know, look in the refrigerator. I don't like the things that are on the table. Go. I think there's something tasty in the refrigerator. But it, 
because it's not understanding anything, but it can, so to speak, um, you know, uh, uh, by by rejecting the the perceived good, sets the agent uh, in search of other options, so to speak. Yeah. Right, right. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But in addition to, even though SCOTUS is associated with what we've been talking about, there's this primacy of the will, or what's been called voluntarism. There's also, as you point out in your book, a remarkable amount of virtue ethics in SCOTUS's uh, moral philosophy. Like he's very interested in, and really just just, just the traditional virtues and, and virtue ethics. Yeah, and and I think. Um... I think he gets this is an overlooked aspect of his thought it really is because if people think of scotus as an ethicist either they focus on the voluntarism or they focus on uh what is sometimes called a divine command inter theory interpretation of scotus and and they just sort of leave it at that and then hmm. if if you think oh scotus is a radical voluntarist and he's a divine command theorist then you might think well why why look to him as a a source for virtue uh, theorizing? Hmm. But but in fact, he he has a lot to say about the virtues. He's not nearly as um, in depth or or perceptive as as Aquinas. I mean, go to go to Aquinas any day of the week. But there is a lot there in Scotus. And and one thing that I think is is very interesting about Scotus's virtue ethics is that in, in part it's a way of um, combining. Uh, this Anselmian two affections uh, th theory about the will mm -hmm. with a broadly Aristotelian uh, virtue theory. So the idea would be this: we have um, the the will as a kind of power that can be uh, 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 disposed well or badly, and so it's the it's the kind of thing that uh, can can be perfected by a virtue. Okay, but now if the will itself has these two inclinations toward the just and toward the personally advantageous, then you might think that <clears throat> there would also be a perfecting disposition of these of each of these affections. And so we we get um I, what I think is a very nice kind of transposition of the four cardinal virtues into Scotus's you know Anselmian anthropology, where we get the the the, uh, the affection for justice is perfected by the virtue of justice. The affection for one's own advantage is perfected both by uh, the by, by both the virtues of of temperance um, and fortitude. And so it's it's you know it's you might think it's quite a different. Uh, cognitive psychology than than Aquinas is, but but the but the four virtue, the cardinal virtues really have a nice home. There isn't a tension here at all. And you might not you might not expect that if um if you think of Scotus as radically innovating um a, a you know on on a broadly Thomistic uh rational psychology. Right. Right. It, it almost seems, if, if I may, that very often in like the popular narrative of like, you know, world philosophy, we focus on what's unique or special to a given thinker instead of seeing uh, their general commitments in, in, in a larger tradition. And, and, you know, I think it's the same with Aquinas, too. I mean, people will focus a lot on his commitments to the, the natural law, but the natural what he had to write about the natural law is very small in comparison to like what he wrote about like justice. Like justice is like he has pages and pages and pages about just on the nature of, of what justice is. Yeah, that's a nice point. And um, it's something that as a, a scholar, uh, as a philosopher and even as a as a Catholic, I I'm particularly interested in emphasizing common ground where there is that uh, to be had. And so, yeah, I think you're like Aquinas and Scotus for all of the um, polemics. Um, they agree about so many more things than they disagree about. Right. <laughs> and, and even the things that they disagree about, you know, it's like if you think about the whole uh, logical space of options on some particular topic. Hmm. Um, it, it, Aquinas and Scotus, even where they disagree, are like this close to each other. 
on almost all of those uh, e options, you know, and so whatever disputes they have are disputes that themselves require sharing a whole bunch of common ground, uh, you know, right. so it's, it's not like we're dealing with, you know, Plotinus and Quine. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, I remember seeing a very famous, or not famous, but like, there's this uh, picture of Thomas Aquinas and Duns Ghost, and they're both like standing next to each other and they got their wings stretched out and they're yeah. like, it, it, yeah. it's supposed to signify like, you know, that these are these two great giants and they're, they're, they hold, you know, wholly different positions, but they really, a lot of theses that Scotus offers, in my opinion, can very easily fit into a, a, a Thomistic philosophy or, or theology. And a lot of the medieval thinkers after uh, Aquinas and Scotus sort of develop Aquinas along Scotistic lines. Yeah, yeah. I I, I recently learned this term from, um, from the great uh, Scotus scholar, Gloria Frost. Um, I don't know if she coined it or not, but she she sometimes describes herself as a scomist, and I just love it. I, I, I'm I'm owning that. I'm, nice. I'm a scomist. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, and then one more thing I want to discuss with respect to Scotus's virtue ethics is the so-called uh, unity thesis. So, uh, for, for for Aristotle, famously, a person is on, only virtuous if if they have all the all the virtues and you can't have one virtue but not have another virtue and intuitively that that, that kind of makes sense like it's really hard to you know have i i, I don't know um the, the 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 virtue of of justice but not have the virtue of prudence like prudence is going to inform how you're going to be just in particular situations but scotus has you might say a a more nuanced perspective on this specific question of, of the unity thesis yeah, yeah. He he doesn't fully deny the the uh the unity thesis, but he he does think that um you could have prudence without having the other virtues, uh the other cardinal virtues. So he doesn't he doesn't think that you could have the the three other cardinal virtues, temperance, fortitude, and justice, without having prudence. Um, so they're not separable in that way, but you could have prudence without having the other three. Okay. And, and I think that there, uh, I think intuitions can take us in both directions, both for the unity thesis and against it. Um, so I'm not sure that intuition alone is, is, um, strong enough to help me decide in my own thinking. I, I suppose if someone were wondering, you know, could you really have, um, could someone really genuinely have the virtue of prudence fail to be uh, to have the virtues of justice, fortitude, and temperance? You might think that that, that question depends on uh, what you might think of as the subject of the cardinal virtues and, uh, you know, like the will, uh, Scotus, Scotus thinks that prudence is a virtue of the intellect, the practical intellect. No, no surprise there. He thinks that the three other cardinal virtues are virtues of the will, as we talked about earlier, you know, the, these perfecting dispositions of the two affections of the will. All right. Now, if you thought that, um, if, if you had a Scotus Scotist understanding of the relationship between the will and the intellect, such that the will retain this freedom. You could imagine a situation where uh, the the practical intellect was perfected by prudence, and so was was reliably judging, um, you know, the correct thing to be done here and now. You know, was was sensitive to relevant information. Uh, to to um, some sort of deliberative context, and yet the will just makes no answer you know, because it's because it has this freedom. So this is this is quite speculative on my part, but I suspect that um, Scotus's rejection of the unity thesis when it comes to the detachability of prudence from the other three um, has to do with a broader commitment to the relationship between intellect and will. But that's that is a little bit speculative on my part. I mean, I. Um, I'll just kind of throw that out there and sure. put that hand. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Well, 
Uh, we're, we're, we're nearing very, uh, the end of our interview period. And I, I figured, um, I could just ask a couple of closing, uh, closing questions, even though SCOTUS might not have the same reputation or, or fame that Aquinas or Bonaventure has, do you think that you could say that there's a modest revival of interest in, in, in SCOTUS in, in recent years? I, I definitely can. And, and I can even sort of prove it, <laughs> um, uh, Tobias Hoffman maintains a bibliography of SCOTUS resources, um, translations, um, Latin texts, uh, in addition to the secondary literature, and he updates it every few years. Uh, I think he's been doing it for about, I want to say, 12 or 15 years, um, and there have been a few editions. So one thing that he noted in the preface to the um, most recent edition, which was either 22 or 21, is that there has been, um, I'm going to get the exact numbers wrong here, but over the past, say, 15 years, uh, sorry, the, the past 15 years or so uh, comprise about 30% of the entries in this, uh, of this, uh, in this SCOTUS bibliography. So if you think about scholarship produced, the Bibliography, Scotus's, Tobias's bibliography starts in 1950. <clears throat> and so we've got about 70 years, but about 30% of the scholarship done on Scotus is from the last 15 years. You know, so it's, so certainly from a scholarly perspective, there's a huge uptick in Scotus. And then just kind of thinking a little like outside of the ivory tower, but people who are still like really intellectually engaged, um, you know, the rise of uh, serious um, non-academic philosophy and theology that's going on 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 YouTube, on podcasts, on social media, and at least in the the, the circles that I'm familiar with, the name of Scotus is just coming up more and more. It, I mean, it really has seemed. It seems like people are beginning to think that this is someone we got to know, even if we disagree with him. Um, with someone we got to know so both in that in that like very technical quasi empirical sense like there's just a lot more scholarship and then also in this more anecdotal you know feeling of of the facts on the ground i'd say yeah there's a big uptick in interest nice and then if i can maybe ask for a, a closing question what books would you recommend for those who uh would want, want to learn more about dun scotus maybe his, his philosophy or or his theology i, I know that very recently you, you you did write this book uh order by love an introduction to john dun scotus it was i i finished reading it a while ago it was very readable it was very enjoyable i, I liked it a lot well well thanks yeah i i I do hope the book finds a, a wide readership, but there are there are some other good stuff out there. So um, on the on the more scholarly side, if someone already has a background in philosophy or theology, I think that Richard Cross's book, um, Dun Scotus, which he wrote in the, um, the the Great Medieval Thinkers series for OUP, I think that's uh, probably the best kind of comprehensive um introduction to SCOTUS that's out there still. Um, I, it's better, it's much more useful than Gilles Sons, which has a lot of interesting stuff in it, but is just unwieldy for someone trying to get situated with SCOTUS for the first time. But right. Cross's book is is still intellectually demanding. So if you want something um, that still is you know, quite introductory, like if you're an undergraduate um, who hasn't taken a lot of philosophy or theology courses, you might, in addition to my book, check out a book by um, Sister Mary Beth Ingham. Um, it's the subtitle of which is Understanding Dun Scotus. And she actually has a few um, a few books on Scotus, in including a couple introductions to Scotus. But but that one in particular, I think, is the best. Um, it's, it's just exceptionally clear. Uh, it, it covers a broad range of Scotus's thought. It's it's definitely my favorite um, book on SCOTUS, introductory book on SCOTUS, not published by a guy named Ward. Right, right. Well, Dr. Ward, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Likewise, Hunter. Thanks a lot for having me.